Hey everybody, welcome to Prequelize This. I am John, we've got Dave hey. and Rich. Hey. And today we're talking about super influential bands from our youth. So the three of us love music so much. We talk about it all the time and that's why we started a YouTube channel. And so what happened? What, what happened when we were young where bands influenced, influenced us so much that we just couldn't get enough of that kind of music, other kind of music, and just going down all of those rabbit holes. So that's what we're talking about today. And we would love to know how our choices line up with your choices. So it'd be great to engage with you in the comments uh, to hear about that. People come from all different ages, of course, right? Uh, people are influenced by the 90s because that's when they grew up, or they're influenced by the 2020s because that's when they grew up. So we're all the same age. This is kind of where we're coming from, but it's really cool to hear about um, the, 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 the kind of things that caused other people to just totally become huge fans of music and make it their hobby and whatever. So that's where we're at today. Uh, we got three each, mm -hmm. so top three for each of us. Uh, let's see who, let's start with the young guy. Let's start with Dave. All right. <laughs> So I am going to start. So one of the things, and we had conversation as we were kind of gearing up for this kind of a thing, and we were talking about influences, we're talking about family influences and so forth. And, and one of the things that I'm going to throw out here, um, I didn't really have a lot of family influence. So I'm not going to have, there's a lot of, I had to go back and learn all sorts of things. In fact, these guys actually helped me out with a lot of stuff. But one of the bands that clicked for me fairly early on, and I'm going to keep pulling stuff out because okay, this wait, is what hold I, on yeah real quick are we going from like third place to the first place like so our our last one is going to be the ult, the super influential one i was kind of going to go a little chronological in here because each of these things will say and, and to me one of the key things is when you're influenced it's the i listened to this and it caused me to listen to and dig into something else and then something else and then something else because it, it started snowballing where you listen to something and you're just loving it and you're digging and you're finding all sorts of stuff. So I'm going to start with one of the bands that early on, and this was not an album, the two albums, I'm going to show two of their albums, and they were not actually the ones that I listened to early because this is a band that had an early 70s period. And then they had kind of a late 80s into the 90s period. And that's where I came in. But then I went back. And when I really fell in love is when I started founding things mm. like this. And you get Aerosmith and you've got Toys in the Attic. Mm. And I got to pull out their other classic from back in the day, Rocks. And those were two bands or two albums from this band. They got the, those two distinct periods, uh, kind of very, to some degree, very different. But there was just something about them, the swagger the bluesy fun of it, um, the way in which they reinvented themselves. In fact, interestingly, I didn't, I didn't pull this out. I should have thought of this. I have only one run DMC album and it's because Aerosmith appears on it. So, I mean, to put it that way, I, I have only one. No, I have, do I have any beastie boys? I might have a beastie boys album. So that's <laughs> like one of two, but I have it on, I have the, the run DMC on vinyl specifically because of Aerosmith. And the fun of that really entertaining reinvention of themselves. They're just, they were just a fun band in their early periods. Awesome. They did some great stuff in that resurgence. They, okay. The end of their career kind of tapers off and the fact that they're kind of doing a farewell right now. I'm, I'm kind of good with that, but talk formative Aerosmith was, it has to be at least the really early one for me. Nice. Nice. Right. That, that is a great the two the two records you showed. That's a great one two punch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, I think we've talked about it before that that like you could take those as a as a amazing double album type of thing. I mean, mm -hmm. they came out. I mean, we were we were really young when they came out, but but yeah. they came out so close together. Um, and man, those are just great albums, both of them yeah. together. Yeah. I mean, if there's two Aerosmith albums you're gonna own, those are the two. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the first two Aerosmith albums I owned. So yeah. nice. That was a great pick. Yeah. Uh, Rich, what you got? All right. So I hate to be a cliche here, but I got to go with the Beatles because I grew up in a Beatles family. My dad was a year older than the two oldest Beatles. So 
that was around when the, he was of their age. And so we just grew up listening to that. And so there's Beatles music as a kid, elementary school or whatever. But the one time that the, I can remember the time that the Beatles actually mattered and they clicked. And I'm like, this band. Um, it was 4th of July weekend. I was like 11 years old. And the oldie station in L.A. was doing one of those uh, countdowns from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, the best and they were in the top 15, and they played A Day in a Life. Mm. And this is the first time, because I'm 11 years old, this is the first time I recognize this song, and they actually played the Sgt. Pepper reprise imp- uh, intro, which they don't always do. So I hear this in the back of the van. We're driving to Knott's Berry Farm, you know, music, local amusement park, and I was, my mind was completely blown. And I just had to dig in their catalog. I had to listen to everything that they did. Every B-side, every bootleg, like everything. And I still am like, you know, I'm one of those fans that, you know, if they say, hey, we just found a recording of Ringo Starr farting into a microphone for 30 seconds. <laughs> going to get back sessions. Yeah, I'm going to probably listen to it. <laughs> yeah. is, I'm a completist. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, I mean, they really influence. I mean, we can go on and on about their influences. That doesn't really need to be said. But I will say that their experimental music and their harmonies and their willingness to push music in a weird, strange directions led me to really like try to dig into. Who are the next Beatles? Who are the next, um, you know, in that genre? Which led me in college to dig into power pop, which a lot of these power pop bands eventually over time got rebranded as indie rock bands. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so I'm a big indie rock guy, and it's because of the Beatles. And that's one of my influences of one of the genres that I am totally into. Yeah. So, John, what do you got? Well, so uh, we did not check the list with each other in advance, which is cool. We're surprising each other uh, here. So I I, I also had – so here's yours. Uh, you mentioned A Day in the Life. Mm-hmm. This is a – I hang these on the wall, so it's in a thing. Uh, but – for me, I liked your story, Rich, about being 11 years old at the 4th of July what picnic or what was it? Um, Just in the car. Let's okay. You old cares one-on-one. So my number one of all time is, is going to be the Beatles. Uh, I think it's like my number one band of all time. It definitely, and it's the early, one of the earliest influences I can think of from my father who was into all kinds of music. We joked about the three Bs at our house being the Beach Boys, the Beatles, and Beethoven, and Bach, and Brahms, and the bees just kept on going. So we loved music at our house. We grew up hearing a lot of things. When I was eight years old, I remember he gathered us around our dining room table, which was next to the stereo. My mom was gone, so was my sister and I, and he pulled out this record that looks like nothing and he unfolds it this by the way is my dad's record uh also the sergeant peppers that i just showed that was my dad's record uh, so he's not with us anymore so i got his beatles records and he played rocky raccoon you guys already know the story mm-hmm. <laughs> and i'm when you're eight years old rocky raccoon's the coolest thing ever and i was totally in uh, from that point forward, and when, and of course we did hear, uh, you know, lots of other music in the house, but the the Beatles then became just a huge thing for me. So yeah, they are they are my number one. And like you said, Rich, you and I both went down the power pop rabbit hole together in the '90s and uh, and uh, early 2000s. And it's funny because I think you know we we talk about like how we all talk about music so much that we did this YouTube channel. It was the first moment that you and I bonded over John was because we yep. lived in dorms across from each other in college and you were playing the white album. And like you tell the story, I walked in there to 
like just hang out and meet new friends. And I never left your room your freshman year because you were playing the White Album. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the joke. Um, and it's great. I, I remember uh, what road trip was it? But you and I like played the entire White Album and we knew every word. Yeah. Like that was so cool. That was a fun time. And still, I mean, one of the best moments of all time for me musically is sitting at your basement at your house in Colorado and listening to the 50th anniversary uh, digital re-recording of Sgt. Pepper. Oh, that surround sound. It was surround sound. Yeah. It we was get... like listening to the album for the first time. It was so incredible. It was incredible. It w there were tears involved. I'll admit it. Uh... Absolutely. All right. Number two, Dave. Uh, well, I'm not going to go down a Beatles trail with you guys. And I will say the, the, the interesting caveat to that is that I jumped in with you guys on the power pop, skipping over the Beatles, never having gotten into them until years later, even. Wow. Um, you tried to influence me on the Beatles and I, in college, I just couldn't care. I enjoyed the, the, the power pop stuff and I, I got into that. So I had to kind of reverse engineer my way into enjoyment of the Beatles. Um, so anyway, blasphemy there and all that kind of stuff or whatever. <laughs> um, but one of the one of the very different, and I would say it's this this one is a band that a lot of bands appreciate, but is one of those that fits in the category to some degree of a band that always you think should have been bigger but never really was. Uh, and I remember this is one, and when we had when uh, we did we had Dan was on the channel for one of the what was it the um, Guns and Roses uh, episode that we did. Oh, and, filter. Yeah, right. So Dan, he and he is the one that turns me on to to this band, and it is King's X. Sorry, the Ooh. glare is kind of playing yeah. really awkwardly. I've got this was the album that. You know, Gretchen goes to Nebraska. That got me going. You get great ones like Faith, Hope, Love is another great one. Great album. Um, just the the melodies, the groove, the drop D tuning, Doug's voice. Uh, you know, he has done so many, let's say, kind of random appearances on all sorts of albums. If Doug shows up on an album, I instantly know it's Doug's voice. There's yeah. just I'm, there's no missing uh, Doug Pinnock's voice, and you know mm -hmm. um, Ty Tabor and his guitar work. Um, he doesn't get enough credit for the skill that he has, just the the melodies and 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 just you know there's so much fun, and they get you know uh, Jerry on his on as a drummer. I even have um, I, don't, do I, have, I think I have both two of his jerry's solo albums i mean who goes and buys a drummer's solo albums hi <laughs> the uber king's x fan who is gonna find oh yeah right i mean you're just gonna dig in you're gonna find all sorts of stuff you know you got find the random doug band where he's like oh i'm gonna do some blues and so i got a grinder blues album you know because they just musically as a group i mean they're still together they're touring again King's X was something else and the amount, the influence they had on so many bands, so many bands that would point to them to say, this is what music is about. It's just beautiful harmonies, the whole deal. It, no, that's great. Yeah. Faith, Hope, Love. I mean, that came out my senior year of high school and uh, that is one of those albums where, that I remember the, like the very first time I heard it, I immediately played it again. You know, I, I, I mean, it just, it, it's, and it's like an hour long. Uh, it's a fairly lengthy one. I mean, the, the CD format had matured enough to where people yeah. were making longer albums and man, it's amazing. This is an amazing album. Yeah. It's a great band. It's a good pick, Dave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so my pick, and again, I, it's funny that you know you, you after King's X, which is not a cliched pick, I'm nope. going to be cliched again just because my second pick has to be Pink Floyd. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I <laughs> yep, exactly. I talked, you know, I talked about how my parents. Well, I also had an older brother, and he was very much into uh, Pink Floyd, and uh, actually, he got my dad into Pink Floyd. Uh, my dad wanted to 
being becoming a huge fan of the wall um and but just listening to you know they're you know they say that the pink floyd is kind of the gateway to prog rock you know uh the great the gateway band and yeah but it was just the musicianship the sound effects just the general weirdness and some of that you know you can say well it came you know it had a beetle influence there too because i mean they recorded piper the gates of dawn at the same time that the beatles were recorded charge pepper um but um their their music there's their there's sonic soundscapes and the atmosphere and the lair and the fact that you just sit there and just kind of float away and you know we've talked about this on previous conversations about how animals and wish you were here are, are, are perfect like work albums because you can just throw them in the background and they just create this this soundscape and that really led me down progressive rocks uh, rabbit hole and gone to other bands and i mean there were other prog influences that would pop in and out every once in a while that fully formed my prog nerdiness but pink floyd it all starts with them and um yeah i am i still you know i know there are people that are like prog purists like oh pink floyd is not really a prog band they are wrong and they are annoying because P4 <laughs> is a prog band and they're great. So John. Awesome. I agree. They are great. Uh, so I'll do the chronological thing that uh, uh, Dave kind of mentioned. So we went to the movies. My family took me to the movies. The opening titles of this film were some athletes are running along a beach. Mm. Yep. Vangelis. Mm. Uh, so this is uh, Vangelis. I, I don't know if it's Vangelis. I, I don't, I don't know. I've been a fan for so long. It's always been Vangelis for me since 1981 when uh, I saw this movie in the theater and I was blown away by that opening titles theme song. And I dove so far into it. it, it you know, then there was the Blade Runner soundtrack that he did mm -hmm. when we were in college uh 1992 ish or something with the cd listening bar open mm -hmm. and it was a cd listening bar something like what 25 cd player player stations with headphones yeah. but you bring them the cd from the racks you bring them the cd they would go into a drawer and pull the disc out of a sleeve and you could listen to it. And they did a pretty good job of having used stuff and also the occasional import. So I built up, and, th and these this is only two, two examples. Uh, one I wanted to show was like, I think this is my oldest one. This goes back to the early 70s, this is 1973. Mm. Um, and then I also wanted to show this one as a recommendation. This is called Soil Festivities. And uh, it's like one, two, three, four, five, four, five tracks that are all, you know, 10 minutes or something. Um, well, the first track is 18 minutes. But anyway, uh, so for long form music, uh, you know, electronic music, really good stuff. I love uh, Vangelis and I really got a love for uh, electronic music out of that Um now I have another influence that I'll be sharing uh, later on in another episode or whatever we're doing there, um, where I'm also into film scores. I'm also into soundtracks quite a bit, mm -hmm. but uh, this was definitely an amazing experience to see the first five minutes of this movie where I couldn't tell you what the rest of the movie's about, but uh, I can tell you that the first five minutes are cinema gold. I mean, the music's amazing. So um, yeah, if if you have any, inclination to check out ele electronic music particularly the dawn of it like like people mastering uh these new synthesizers that were super clunky and super huge and making them sound way better than you know your atari 2600 video games that you had when you were a kid just amazing soundscapes out of this artist so yeah cool 
Check. Yeah. Awesome. Dave, All number right. three. So number three, the big three. And weirdly enough, I was thinking about this. Um, out of three bands, why do I have two from Boston? Hmm. So that might give you a little bit of a hint. But this is this is one where I can remember being at a friend of mine's house, this kid named Teddy, and I'm hanging out with him. And you know, I didn't and I didn't have cable as a kid. You know, I was one of those kids. It's like, you know, if I wanted to go watch MTV, I gotta go over and hang out at Teddy's house. And we're over there, and this band comes on, and one of their first videos comes on, and I'm just like, everybody shut up. What is this? And this was the yeah. album. The extreme extreme just I mean blew my mind. And I remember sitting with Dan when their second album comes out. And I think this CD, no, it was before I got that. So I had the cassette of it. And we were in, watch, I don't even remember what movie. We went to a movie. I had a cassette copy of the thing. And I'm pulling it out. And I'm looking at the liner notes and whatever else. And I'm like, I can't wait to listen to this thing. And, you know, and there, you've also, I love this one. The Three Sides yep. is excellent, beautiful one of their albums that doesn't get the same level of attention, but that first three album run is spectacular. And I will say this last year with six coming out and that fun gorilla cover and so forth, solid album as well. So I mean, good. the fact that they're back and, and, you know, this is one I, I've seen them in concert four times. I've seen every single drummer they've had <laughs> in that process. Uh, and cannot say enough about, you know, to watch. I mean, Gary still has it. The stage presence is unbelievable. He moves um, like a spider. He does. I mean, I, I mean, what is he, 60 at this point? And I'm yeah. like, how do you have any skinny and in shape? And it's, it's almost disgusting. But um, Nuno is unbelievable on guitar. Just ridiculous um pat badger is an excellent bass player i don't think he gets the credit that he needs um i'm, I'm always blanking on the the most recent um crud, i'm blanking on the last the most recent drummer but you know i mean you you know you had paul gary initially and you had um mike mangini so you know for those dream theater fans mm -hmm. you know i've seen mike in multiple bands <laughs> and he is a technical wizard as a drummer it, it just it, you know and like, i think they called it the current guy there's like figgy figgy or something like that I, i'm i'm blanking on exactly what his last name is apologies on that but i mean he is solid and he was one that he, that played um when nuno was doing some of his solo stuff in between you know with he had one incarnation of that was uh drama gods which is an excellent mm -hmm. album I wish I would have found it and picked it up. Um, you cannot find a physical copy of that stupid thing anymore. Mm. Uh, but it is just an amazing. You kind of see where the lat like the last two albums worth of stuff. There was some solo work that Nuno did that then kind of puts them on a track record for the last two albums, even though they've been spaced out by a big distance. But anyway, so that's my second Boston band in a in a list of three. Just, I cannot say enough about ex Extreme. They are fantastic. Yeah. All right. Good. That's and a cool. That's a cool way you got it. Uh, <clears throat> intro to them. I mean, my intro to them was the Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Yep. Yeah, but when that came around, I was excited. Like that was awesome and whatever. But I had already seen kind of you know it was it it, it was the little girls video that's the one i think it might have been their first um single if i'm not mistaken so it's like right from the beginning i'm listening to this thing and there's just a, i knew there was something fun about them and i've been raving clearly ever since yeah 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 our friend uh, our mutual friend joe and i we were like we were latchkey kids uh you know and uh, working parents and all that stuff and we uh so we would hang out at his house uh, just memorizing that second album, I, just, I remember that. Oh, yeah. just played played that thing on on repeat. It's good stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, Rich, what you got for us? Uh, I really could easily throw in like one of three bands, and really, I was really juggling 
which one was going to get this uh, spot here. Before I do, I have to say, John, about your Vangelis pick, uh, I'm right there with you with that. And I think that that's one of the reasons why I was describing the atmosphere of Pink Floyd that led me down the rabbit hole of groups of that nature. The ones, the musicians and the artists that could create layers of sound through music and just create like paintings, like mental paintings. Yeah. And, uh, that's Vangelis is absolutely brilliant for that. Um, so I will tell you that the third, the, the band that I wound up going into, um, was black Sabbath. Mm. Um, and I'll tell you who the other two were because I think we're going to extend this conversation in another episode. Yeah. But again, my I have an older brother who is in metal, and I will say that the three genres that I that I, that I really stuck with is indie rock, prog rock, and metal. And um, it all starts with the mother dough. I mean, I got into other metal bands, other hard rock bands, but. I remember because my brother, and it was weird because I kind of did what you did, Dave. It was like I kind of went backwards a little bit because yep. I was nine, ten years old, and Black Sabbath was with Ronnie James Dio on vocals. So Ooh. when I was like nine, ten, you had Ozzy come out with Blizzard of Oz with Randy Rhodes on guitar, and then you had, you know, Ronnie James Dio and the rest of the original Sabs. Um, you know, with Heaven and Hell, Mob Rules, not, you know, not in that order. Yep. But, and then you discover Paranoid. And then you hear, um, you know, you hear that just raw and just how real those lyrics were. And, you know, just the one, one of the hallmarks that I like about heavy metal music is when they're not doing fantastical stuff like and being nerdy like referencing like a stephen king book or an old uh, samuel taylor coleridge poem their lyrics are talking about serious issues and heavy issues and those four first black sabbath those are huge and as far as like those lyrical content goes, and it's not just ooh, you know, because we all grew up in the era they say of the satanic panic, and it's like yeah, ooh, you know, you listen to Black Sabbath, you're the devil. No, these four, these are four kids that came out of Birmingham, UK, at a time where everybody was singing "All You Need Is Love," and they're like, screw that, we're from Birmingham, and everything sucks. Let's write songs about that. <laughs> And, you know, I come from a blue collar family and my dad was in the steel mill or steel worker. And, you know, his plant closed down when I was uh, nine, 10 years old. And so those lyrics of hardship, especially coming from a band from an industrial town, even though it was in a different country, that resonated. And that really got me to pay attention to lyrics and pay attention to all these other things and then you know then you throw on like the heavy riffs and the time signature changes and all these other uh bold melodic choices and that just led me to okay let's do this and then of course that led me down to other uh uh metal um subcategories like progressive metal and power metal and all this other stuff so yeah i mean there you go i mean i you know any rock Beatles, prog rock, Pink Floyd, and metal Black Sabbath. So, yeah, solid pick. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I always thought it was pretty wild that they were a growing up influence for you. Like, like <laughs> Black Sabbath was being played at, like at your house or whatever when you were young. Like, I'm just like, what? Because you know, the heaviest I got, I'm about to show you, but. Uh, you're you're the reason I became a big Black Sabbath fan, Rich. You know, yeah, I mean, oh, uh, I, I gotta say it's it, I gotta cheat because I had an older brother who was uh, six, seven years older than, than me, so he knew all about this other stuff. So when all these other kids were listening to like Eddie Grant, 
walking down Electric Avenue, I was already into all these hard rock, heavy metal bands, and you know they're all considered classic now. But when you're nine or ten, you those aren't necessarily the bands you listen to. Yeah. And again, my dad, because of his influence, because he would listen to, you know, he would listen to my brother playing Heaven and Hell, and then two weeks later, he had like half the songs on a mix mixtape that he recorded that we would pop in the car. So that was what you know was surrounded. I'm very grateful for that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. The heaviest thing that uh, that my dad was playing was was the White Album. Mm. Um, so. Mm. Well, Helter Skelter did start uh, heavy metal, so there's that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So my uh, my third one is another uh, family member influence. So Dave, you know, you didn't you preface that you didn't really have that same experience, but like Rich and I have older siblings, right? So uh, you know, Rich heard a lot of stuff from his older siblings. I heard a lot of stuff from my older sister, and that is then that's this one. So I'm going cliche. Mm. And uh, that's the mighty Led Zeppelin. And she played uh, Led Zeppelin for me. We were going to the movies. I was so excited. You know, when you're a little, when you're a younger sibling you, and you're whatever it is, 10, you know, 11 or something. Well, let's see. She was driving. So I was 13, I guess, or something. It's so cool that when your older sibling wants to hang out with you, you know, do something with you, go somewhere. And we were going to the movies, just her and I. And I was like, that is rad. I'm going to the movies, no mm -hmm. parents. We were going to see Crocodile Dundee <laughs> at the La Mirada 5 or whatever it's called. I don't know. Yep. And on the way, she's like, I don't know. if she, I feel like she said this. I don't know if she really said this. But I feel like she said, I'm about to blow your mind. <laughs> because that's what happened. And she put on Black Dog. She put on the start mm. of, of yeah. Led Zeppelin's fourth album. Black Dog came on, then followed by Rock and Roll, the song Rock and Roll. And that changed me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, whatever year that is, that Crocodile Dundee came out, I was there probably 85-ish? 88. No, no, 88, I was in sophomore in high school already, and I, my sister wouldn't talk to me. But you're in 86, <laughs> No, no, like, I want to say 85, but. Hold on, yeah. I'm, like, Googling this as we speak. Okay. Live on the YouTube. All right. Well, you That's just my gut that feeling. One. That's my gut yeah. feeling of when it is. Because by the time. 1986. 86. Okay, well, then early. I don't know. Yeah. It, because it wasn't too long before Joel, our uh, high school friend, introduced me to, or gave me the master of puppets tape mm. formative right uh, you know like you were saying rich you know indie rock prog metal man it's crazy how music when you're open to to different genres and you're not being you're not having a, a you know like a you're not being raised in a way where you're only like all into one genre or something like that or have a friend group where they don't your friend group you know discourages you from branching out into mm -hmm. different music I think it's wonderful how uh, different kinds of music can just open up so many doors when yeah. you start to see the ways that they connect and the way that they're related and you find one band and then there's another band and then there's another band and you're like, this is so great. <laughs> yeah. Which is why this doesn't stop here where we're going to stop what we're talking about because we've done our top three influential bands for us. But there's all the ones, like I was saying earlier to you guys before we started recording, that I even shuffled my list a little bit today, where there are bands that were on the list. There are a couple of them that didn't make the cut. So we're going to be doing a follow-up to this episode, looking at kind of our next five influential bands. So the bands that continued, that didn't make that cut for the top three, but... Here's five more of them. So if you're looking at the three that each of us had and you're saying, hey, dude, but what about? Mm -hmm. well, we, we might get to the what abouts. We'll see. So <laughs> watch out for the next episode. We're going to dig in. At that point, instead of nine of them, you get 15 of them, and then we'll find out. And, and if you still don't have yours, you can comment and hey, dude, us then and get all over us about what we missed and whatever else. But for rent now, hopefully you enjoyed uh, the top three three influential bands for at least the three of us 
and you know share what what ones are influential to you and maybe it's maybe it'll be some surprises that we've not even heard of but in the meantime hey happy listening and we'll catch you next time when we hit our top well i guess the next five yeah, yeah. give us a like and a subscribe ring that bell for notification too ring all the stuff bell. All, All that the stuff. stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. Bye.